Okay, uh, so let's get started. Um, welcome. It's not changing. Okay, there we go. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Lasse. Uh, I'm a senior pro programmer at uh, Playdead Games. Um, some of you may be familiar with the previous title uh, published by the company. It's called Limbo. Um, today I'm going to talk about tempo reprojection, anti-aliasing in our upcoming game, Inside. Um, a little bit of background before we get started. Um, Inside is a side-scrolling game. Uh, it's a mix between puzzle solving, platforming, exploitation. Um, in Inside we have lots of geometric detail and we have many interleaved layers of transparency. Um, our camera is always slightly moving, so if we don't have any sort of temporal st uh, stabilization, then we get lots of crawling. Um, we wanted to have really clean and stable images uh, for this game. Uh, and in early 2014, we began looking into temporal anti-aliasing. And uh, I whipped up a quick first implementation of this based on what was available on the internet and in my own head, and it quickly became our primary anti-aliasing solution during production. So, uh, what is temporal anti-aliasing? Uh, maybe not everyone is familiar with this term. It's a spatial temporal post-processing technique. Uh, uh, what does that mean? It means that it uses a uh, spatial relationship between fragments in multiple frames to to, to make a correlation and uh, use some information from the past time to refine the fragments that we have just rendered in, in the current rasterization pass. It's uh, uh, inserted in the post-process chain as a, as a pass. Uh, after We do it after opaque transparency and pretty much everything except the last distortion effects. So, and it's a feedback loop. It, it reads from a history buffer and it writes to uh, add the same history buffer in a double buffered fashion. With temporal anti-aliasing, sub-pixel information is recovered over time, which is really nice for, for having stable images. Here's what it looks like. Um, on the left, we have uh, like a raw uh, output uh, from the engine with no AA, and on the, on the right, we have... Uh, our temporal solution in action. And notice that uh, like we have, uh, like the edges of the fence here can cross pixel boundaries without just jumping across them in one go. Uh, it's, it's a stable output. Here's another example. Uh, here it's uh, interesting to note that the noise from uh, a sparsely sampled directional occlusion is sort of vacuumed by the temporal solution that we are employing, uh, creating uh, like a much smoother image uh, on the right. Another example uh, here with the Boring sensor, uh, and it's, yeah, I think the results are obvious. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, every step of the technique and uh, I want to start with some basic intuition. Um, so let's forget about pixels for a moment and think about cameras between frames. And uh, if we have some surface in space and we have a camera looking at a local region, uh, like a local surface region, and then we have another camera in the past that's also looking at this region but from a slightly different perspective, then we are having, then we, with rasterization, we obtain some slightly different information about this local region on a surface. So, in a sense, rasterization, it has these unpleasant, these unpleasant artifacts, so like aliasing artifacts, but these could also just be viewed as a variation. And if we can make the correlation and step back in time, then we can use this variation to refine the current frame. So to step back in time, uh, we want to make a correlation between current frame fragments and fragments in previous frames. And we can do this spatially uh, with a uh, reprojection. And reprojection is a known technique, uh, like it relies on depth buffer information, so it's limited to the closest uh, written fragment. Uh, and, but it's not always possible. Sometimes the data just isn't there. 
this is uh, the case when we have disocclusion. Um, so like we see some fragment and it's just not in our history. Uh, we can do a reprojection, but we are going to see a different uh, surface from the previous perspective. And if we just like blend those together, then we are doing something. Uh, we are, it's a false reprojection. Additionally, if we don't have any change in the relationship between the viewer and the subject, then we don't gain any extra information from stepping back in time. There's no variance. So like step one, uh, jitter your view frustum. Uh, if your camera is static and you have a static scene, then you are effectively losing information. So every frame prior to rendering, uh, pick some offset from a sample distribution and use this offset to share your view frustum. Um, like uh, just refer to GL frustum for this. Uh, I'll get back to sample distributions later. They are, of course, uh, super important. Uh, then the temporal pass, uh, it looks like this. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a full screen pass, and uh, the inputs to these are uh, the history buffer, so a temporally stable image containing uh, uh, anti aliased uh, uh, yeah, uh, colors. Uh, and uh, uh, an input frame, which is the raw output from, from the rasterizer and all of those passes. And that's color depth and velocity. I'm gonna uh, go into reprojection first. So we have some fragment that we are in, in our full screen post pass. Uh, and let's just start in this texture called in the PUV. Uh, if we look at it on the boundary of the view first, it looks something like this. Uh, then we can sample the depth buffer and reconstruct the world space position by just interpolating a corner ray and then scaling by the, the linear depth. Once we have the world space position, we can reproject this into the previous frame uh, just by using the previous frame model view matrix. <clears throat> uh, when we do this, we obtain uh, some normalized device coordinates and we can transform those into texture space again. And uh, then we have this uh, QUV uh, that we can use to look up in our history buffer and then we have completed our reprojection. So for dynamic scenes, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, we cannot rely that on just a depth buffer. Um, we use a velocity buffer. We generate this in a separate pass before the temporal pass, and we initialize it to camera motion vectors just using the same approach as with reprojection, sampling the depth buffer. And then we render the dynamic objects on top uh, with a, just a, like a biasing uh, test. Once we have a velocity buffer, the reprojection becomes a read and a subtract in the, in the temporal pass because we just look up the velocity in the, in, the, in the current fragment and then we step negatively to obtain where we should sample our history buffer. So I should add that we don't actually sample the velocity directly in the current fragment uh, because if we do, then uh, fragments on edges of objects, they won't travel with uh, the occluders. Uh, we use the velocity of the closest depth-wise sample within our 3x3 three three region. Um, and um, this is similar to a suggestion by Keris. Um, and uh, the result is uh, nicer edges in motion. Here's an example of this. On the left, we have velocity from the current fragment being used to, to do the reprojection. And on the right, we have uh, velocity from the closest fragment in the 3x3 three three region. So now we have our reprojection uh, completed and we have a history sample. We have to constrain this history sample because as I mentioned, we may have a, a false reprojection. And I will talk about this now. So sometimes the reprojection is false and the history sample uh, is uh, essentially invalid. Um, and uh, it, like, it can be because of disocclusion and objects moving around. Um, and it can also be because of transparency layers in front of, like in the line of sight in, in one, from one perspective, and these layers being uh, absent in the next uh, perspective. If we trivially accept the history sample, then we get this ghosting uh, like effect and smearing like I illustrated on the right. Uh, 
So we have to constrain our history sample. There are various ways to do this, uh, depth-based rejection, uh, velocity ring, Sousa, Jimenez uh, described this very well. Um, I spend a bit of time uh, implementing velocity weighing and trying to get this right, uh, but found that it was really fragile. Um, uh, the threshold itself was sliding in history. Um, it was difficult to get it right. And it doesn't really, like it doesn't do anything about transparency layers. So you can, like we don't have velocities for transparency layers. Uh, and we have a lot of them interleave between our layers of opaque geometry due to uh, volumetrics and artist placed uh, uh, like um, sun rays and stuff like that. So, and we didn't want to just run temporal after the opaque pass. We needed something that would handle these cases. Uh, so I went back to the brick wall for a while and then uh, I read this, uh, these slides uh, from, from, uh, from Sousa and that was uh, like a, a big rescue, this uh, neighborhood clamping concept for us. Um, so just to, to recap what is neighborhood clamping, it's, a, it's like a pure color space operation. And it's like you, clamp, you expand a, a local color space around the, the current fragment from, from the raw rasterization. And then you take your history sample and you smash it into that space. Um, and uh, what Sousa did uh, in, in, in these slides, uh, well, what was written there, was that uh, you, you would use four taps and a center text, and then you would clamp your history sample to the, the local color space uh, that enveloped these samples. Uh, quick test uh, showed that this gave a big improvement in stability over velocity ring, uh, and we could, we could work with that. Um, so, and you don't have to use RGB uh, to, to do this operation. You can also do the clamping to an, uh, a box in a different color space if you want to rotate that around in relation to RGB. Um, the first implementation of neighborhood clamping uh, for inside was like a di dynamic variation of SUSE's four type approach. Uh, I used a variable distance to four sample points decided per pixel where a higher velocity in, uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the current fragment would result in the four taps being like inching closer to the center texel. And this meant that uh, it was pretty strict on motion. When stuff was moving fast, then we wouldn't uh, allow uh, uh, a large variation from, from the center texel. This gave us pretty decent results without having a velocity buffer. Uh, for per object velocities, um, and we didn't have this at that time. We used this approach for about a year, and it enabled um, artists and 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 um, yeah, artists to tailor effects and content to the unique properties of having a, a temporal algorithm that also elim eliminates noise uh, from stochastic effects. Um, then uh, later in the production, we got a bit more headroom. Uh, and uh, I decided to ax the dynamic four type approach and try to improve the image quality and it kind of coincided with another presentation being published uh, by Karis uh, who is, uh, is a just use a three by three neighborhood and, 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 and just eat the extra uh, cost from doing more sam samples. So Karis uses a, like a larger and rounded neighborhood and then he does clipping instead of clamping. And uh, it's not just like a three by three neighborhood, it's also blended with a minimum maximum of five taps in a plus pattern. And it's more expensive to do this, but the image quality is better. And like, I love the uh, dynamic four tap approach that we had going, but there was just, okay, this, this was just better. So, so, so we axed it. Uh, also, clipping is really interesting, at least when you look at it geometrically. And I, like, I experimented with it a lot, and I felt like it had faster convergence um, because clipping doesn't exhibit this problem of uh, the constrained sample uh, ending up in corners of the local color space. And I've illustrated that uh, in the bottom left here. So clipping is. Uh, in the theater can be a little bit slow uh, and doing the proper line clip between 
a, like an arbitrary size bounding box on two points. There, there are problems with this, and you, of course there is a stable algorithm, but it's tedious to, to run this um, for, for every fragment. So we just clip towards the center of the bounding box, and because we do this, uh, we can just do the calculate the divisor for the ray towards the uh, the, his, the unconstrained history sample uh, in a unit uh, cube space. So we we transform the vector to the history sample from the center of the bounding box into unit space. Then we calculate a uh, divisor there, and then we apply that in the actual clip space. So now we have our constrained history sample and. Uh, uh, the next step is to weigh that uh, and use some history and use some uh, amount of data from the raw input. And uh, when we do this weighing, we use the unjittered uh, input color buffer. Uh, the unjittering is, is done by just subtracting the jitter from the texture coordinates, uh, so we rely on bilinear filtering for this. And I mean that works for us. It's nice because we don't introduce any jittering into the into the feedback loop. So we calculate our feedback color uh, by doing a blend between the the unjittered input and the constrained history sample, and then we copy this to the output. Um, in calculating the feedback color, uh, we have to uh, use a feedback factor, obviously, and we want to use a a feedback factor that is as high as possible to increase retention because everything that is nice and clean uh, ideally is in our history sample, constrained history sample. Um, but I have to be aware of artifacts also uh, when choosing the feedback factor. Like you want to set it pretty high, but like there are, there's going to be cases where you'll see some trailing artifacts. Um, uh, case in point, the silhouette of the boy um, uh, I was looking at uh, on my workstation, it runs pretty slow, and uh, I was looking at the boy at really low frame rates and uh, at a low resolution, and I noticed these uh, fringing artifacts on his edge when he was doing like fast motions such as turns, landings, uh, etc. And uh, of course this is a property of neighborhood uh, clamping clipping, that history fragments can linger if none of the neighbors force them out, and they that's the case for one frame when this happens near an edge. And it's only really distinct at artificially low resolution and frame rate, but uh, I looked at this and I was really annoyed by it. I wanted to do something about it anyway. And I sat with another graphics programmer uh, in a company and we were running back and forth this bar uh, on, in a high con contrast area and just thinking about what can we do and then but these fragments have like high motion vectors, um, so I thought, why don't we just conceal it with a little bit of motion blur in those cases? So uh, adding motion blur to the temporal pass um, to conceal these type of artifacts uh, looks a bit like this. Um, so um, we update the history buffer just like before, and then for the output target where we are seeing the artifacts, uh, um, so the screen, basically. We blend the uh, feedback uh, that, uh, or what we are writing into history with uh, uh, another color, which is a motion blurred uh, sample. So, um, and we apply the same on jittering uh, to the texture coordinate where we, where we do this. Uh, the amount of motion blur we introduce in each fragment is depending on the on the per pixel velocity, and uh, we begin introducing a little bit of motion blur at a ma when the velocity has a magnitude of two or, or above, and we stop, uh, like we are only motion blurred, <laughs> uh, motion blur information when, when the magnitude is 15. It's just a linear scale. So this forces transition to motion blur, uh, but not in the feedback loop uh, for really fast moving fragments. And it includes the immediate neighbors uh, of the current fragment due to the velocity sample relying on the closest depth-wise fragment. So here's the, like an illustration of what that looks like for the bore. 
it's a kind of an exaggerated example. You have to run at like sub 20 uh, frames per second and have a really terrible resolution to notice this because it's for a frame or two. Um, but yeah, it kind of, it, it's not pleasant either way, but uh, fringing fragments on the left, I find them really distracting. Excuse me. So putting it all together, um, the game looks like this. So I mentioned that uh, <laughs> I would get back to the sample distribution thing. Um, uh, this uh, for us took a lot of trial and error. Um, I took a very practical approach. Um, I spent some weeks with my head really close to my screen uh, in the office with the Windows magnifying glass uh, fully zoomed in and I would look at all the pixels and obsess over high contrast regions. Um, I wanted to find a really good balance between quality and speed of convergence. Um, at the time we were targeting 30 frames per second and now we are 1080p 60. Um, so that, but that was hugely important back then. And also considering uh, heuristics, uh, that would be uh, interesting because we have this side scrolling behavior and mostly uh, horizontal movement. There was this scene in the game, uh, I think it was caught, uh, where there would be a very low inclination and the boy would be able to run on the slope and there was this lamp that when you ran down the slope it would sort of fade into view and then you would run back up the slope and it, the light would hide under the shade. And I would run up and down the slope again and again with different distributions and offsets from the textile uh, sensors just to see where I would get like a really nice transition for that single or like half pixel uh, line uh, under the lampshade. Uh, this is uh, like an artificial reconstruction of this happening. It's not the actual scene, but uh, and I think I was more zoomed in also. Um, but yeah, that's how it went. The cop loves it. Um, so we are using a history buffer that is exponential and the samples weigh less over time and that is the reason why we need to use a high feedback factor otherwise we get a like a visible cycle and uh, I, like it's interesting to see that if we use 90% of history compared to 10% of the of the of the actual output of the rasterizer in a frame then 16 frames later uh, that information that was history at that time, it's down to 18.5%. Um, so, I mean, things fade out fast. And uh, for the sample distribution, it's nice to revisit. I found that it's nice to revisit same subpixels regions often because the above figure on the right here assumes that we are just like trivially accepting every, every single history sample. And that's not the case because we do a, a, a clipping uh, based on the neighborhood. And this will compress the tail of the history in the frame that we are doing, applying the constraint. Uh, and that further like reduces how, how, how long history lives on um, as, the, as the frames go on. So we want to quickly return to some data within a, a single pixel so that if we are constraining our way out of it because of some sudden motion in one direction or the other, we get back to that and obtain some information about that particular part of a surface that we can reconstruct a nice edge or smoothen out a bit of aliasing uh, from theta aliasing, whatever. So initially used very few sample points in our sampling distributions. So here are some of the sequences. I tested some of them are like a bit brain dead and I just wanted to pick something and get going. Uh, interestingly, for a year, we used a second one on the top row, uh, which I called uniform four helix in the code. And it worked really well, despite the rectangular pattern and just being four samples for us, because it crosses the horizontal uh, 
line in uh, the pixel uh, in every frame. So you can imagine like going from left to right and it would stitch um, across uh, uh, hard edges. Uh, I played around with some, uh, some others as well. And then when we did the switch to the three by three neighborhood and clipping then, and there was also in Karis' presentation a suggestion to use the health and distribution. Uh, uh, a colleague of mine also is like, let's try and health on. And I was like, okay, let's try health on. And uh, we did that. And uh, I eventually settled on the 16 first samples of the health on two, three sequence. So while using the four tab neighborhood, uh, as I said, uniform four helix, four helix was my favorite. Like the short cycle meant that you return to the same subtextual region quickly, which is nice. Uh, and uh, it does the stitching thing and then uh, switch to the 16 indices of Halton. And the coverage in this distribution is obviously much better. Uh, so like everything converges a lot more uh, when uh, the circumstances allow this. And um, uh, it's pretty good at getting back to the same pixel regions, uh, even though the cycle length is a lot longer because of the way of the the way the sequence is. Then I also spent some time looking at a motion perpendicular pattern. I don't know if maybe you noticed on previous slide. Um, that would be based on the trajectory of, of, of camera motion in screen space. Um, it didn't develop into, thing, any, into anything that's going to be used uh, in a release of our game. Um, but I think it's interesting to try and squeeze the distribution along the line of camera motion in this space. It needs more cooking time. So a summary of our implementation uh, is that well, we did our view first room with the 16 first samples of, of uh, Halton 2.3. Then we generate a velocity buffer. Our engine doesn't provide one, uh, the one we are using, um, uh, which is Unity. Uh, so we and we initialize this to camera motion vectors, and then we add in uh, dynamic motion vectors with um, manual tagging. Uh, yeah, uh, and then we do read projection by sampling our velocity buffer, uh, and we use the closest depth-wise um, fragment to to identify where we should sample the velocity. Then we do neighborhood clipping, where we sensor clip to the RGB minimum maximum of, of a rounded three by three region like Harris. And then we have this added motion blur fallback that kicks in when the magnitude uh, exceeds two and it's in full effect at 15. And we don't apply this to the feedback loop. We don't apply it to our history. And uh, it, it's not uh, like the code. I haven't uh, performance crunched on this code. I think I spent a total of uh, three, two and a half to three months over a couple of years like going in and then doing other stuff on the production. So it's not, I'm sure there's stuff to optimize this, one, around 1.7 milliseconds on Xbox One at 1080p. So of course, uh, this implementation is greatly inspired by a lot of people and their work. Um, so Yang, Sousa, Jimenez, Keris, Maguire, everything that was put online in other people's presentations, like hugely appreciate this. And uh, my slides are also gonna be available. Uh, temporal anti-aliasing, it also has some really nice side effects. So it's great at sucking up noise from stochastic effects. Uh, so shadows, reflections, volumetrics all benefit from this greatly. Um, we have a lot of these effects in our game that are, that are sort of standing on top of temporal A being great. And these are discussed uh, in detail uh, in, a, in a talk about inside rendering, which is in a couple of hours by two of my colleagues, Mikkel and Mikkel. So you should definitely go and see that. It's awesome. Uh, Plated is hiring. So if anyone wants to come and talk to us about having a job, uh, you can email us or job at plated.com. You're also welcome to talk to me and I'll give you a card or something. Um, and that's the end of my talk. Uh, Thank you for coming. Um, as an extra note, uh, we are releasing the full source code to our implementation, and it should be on GitHub, uh, or it will be very soon. Uh, it's flagged private, but I think it may be public now. 
uh, and you can email me uh, with questions and if we have time for it, uh, you can also ask questions now if you have any. Thank you.